17-year-old Andrew Bramlett is a local historian living in Kennesaw, Georgia. He's vice president at the Kennesaw Historical Society and an honorary member of the Cemetery Preservation Commission for the city of Kennesaw. He volunteers with the Kennesaw Parks and Recreation Department and at the Kennesaw Mountain National Battlefield Park, where he is a tour guide on the shuttle bus to the top on the weekends. He is also the social media administrator for the Friends of Kennesaw Mountain. He manages two social media sites, a site on rural history called Archive of the Past and a site on Georgia history called Peach State Past. And I've actually used both of those <laughs> in the past month or so. In 2018, Mr. Bramlett won a Georgia Historical Records Advisory Council Award for local history advocacy due to his work on the history of the city of Kennesaw, Kennesaw Mountain, and his Kennesaw City Cemetery walking tour. Andrew was named the 2023 Honorary City Historian for the city of Kennesaw earlier this year, and he is also the archivist for the Save Ackworth History Foundation. He's a very busy very busy young man. Andrew speaks to civic groups, senior centers, and community groups on a variety of topics ranging from local history to topics that can be used anywhere in the world, which is why we are so pleased to have Andrew with us here today. Everyone help me in welcoming Andrew Broomlet to the Georgia Archives. Before I get started, I do want to say I will try to stay near the mic if I can. If I wander away, feel free just to raise your hand to just shout I mean, to get back to it. The other thing, of course, I do recognize today is Friday the 13th. Hopefully, that's all the technical difficulties we'll have. Um, I will say traffic was especially good getting here today, so hopefully that's a good omen. So for today's presentation, I'll be talking about former state parks in Georgia. Throughout our state, there are 62 state parks and historic sites, from FDR's Little White House to the natural wonder of Cloudland Canyon to beauty of the Georgia coast. However, there are over 40 sites, once managed by the state of Georgia, that are no longer part of today's state park system. In today's presentation, I'll be sharing these forgotten stories. Before beginning, I do want to share just a brief history of our state park system itself, kind of for a bit of context. Back in 1825, the Muscogee tribe negotiated a Treaty of Indian Springs with the govern government of Georgia. Uh, with the signing of that treaty, the creek were pushed out of our state. Um, off towards um, with Alabama originally, then further out west, uh, sort of towards Oklahoma, kind of um, came before the Trail of Tears with a white Cherokee. As part of that treaty, the land that had been the Muscogee land was divided up into lots to give to settlers. One of those lots in Indian Springs, modern day Butts County, was actually set aside uh, for the use of the people of the state of Georgia as sort of a park. Um, almost like a health resort as well, due to the spring's uh, supposed natural he healing powers. With that, Georgia became the first state in the United States of America to set aside land for preservation like this. Indian Springs State Park is often considered the very first state park in the whole of the country, um, making us rather important state parks history-wise. We wouldn't get another state park for about 110 years when Vogel State Park was established in the 1930s up in North Georgia. Since then, the system has grown quite significantly. In the 1930s, the Minnesota Civilian Conservation Corps, part of FDR's New Deal, did a lot of work to help develop many of the early state parks and historic sites throughout our state, along with national parks and many other um, cultural sites in Georgia. The CCC will be, will be coming back to their story um, later in today's presentation. I wanted to go ahead and kind of talk about them at the beginning, because they do play such an important role um, in, in our state's history. Jumping right in, the first of the state parks I would like to cover is the Old Rock House State Historic Site. This was off in McDuffie County in the city of Thomaston. Its story begins back in 1754, when a man named Edmund Gray came to Georgia looking for a place to start a Quaker community. He found a site and he called his new town Brandon. He was a Native American territory, however, which made the town very illegal. For graduates, it soon grew um, as more and more Quakers came into Georgia. In 1768, the Treaty of Augusta was signed by Governor James Wright, which made the land where Brandon was weekly open to settlers. Around the same time, Quakers in North Carolina experienced a split um, sort of in their denomination, and many of the North Carolina Quakers ended up here in Georgia. Governor Wright gave them a land near Brandon to settle, 
and as a way of showing their thanks, they named the new settlement Waitsboro. In 1799, the Waitsboro Meeting House was built, it was a focal point of the town, and it was fortunately lost in a fire about 10 years later. In 1810, a new building was built, and that's what's shown on the screen. Uh, it's still standing today and still used as a meeting house. In 1773, Thomas Ansley of New Jersey moved to Wrightsboro. He built a stone house for him and his family in 1785. Uh, walls of it were two, foot, two feet thick, and it was very similar in design to homes in his native New Jersey. The house had three levels, a basement, a main floor, and an attic. And according to legend, the house was designed so it could be entered by a ladder. In case of an attack from Native Americans, they could pull the ladder up and use the house as a fort, at least in theory. Uh, Thomas Ansley was not a Quaker and did not share the pacifist views, which did cause, you know, a point of contention, especially during the Revolution. Ansley actually saved from Georgia militia and passed away in 1809. While you probably have not heard of Thomas Ansley, you definitely have heard of one of his descendants, Jimmy Carter. It was um, Ken Thomas of the AJC that did Jimmy Carter's family history and was able to um, find Thomas Ansley uh, in his genealogy. The city of Wrightsboro prospered until around 1920. Um, Ansley Stone House was actually stuccoed in the 1920s. Uh, they covered up the original exposed stone. But other than that, it remained roughly unchanged in those 135 years. In the 1950s, the house was abandoned and vandals damaged the interior. By 1970, the house had been purchased by a group called the Wrightsboro Preservation Foundation, who were dedicated to preserving and sharing the history of the community of Wrightsboro and the Quakers in Georgia. In 1973, during Jimmy Carter's administration, the house was actually donated to the state for use as a state park. It became known as Old Rock House State Historic Site. Since the site had been damaged by vandals over the years, it was in a remote part of the state. It would take a lot of funds to get it restored. And unfortunately, the state decided it just didn't really fit in with the rest of the state park system. Because of that, it was actually given back to that Wrightsboro Preservation Foundation in 1975. Today, the foundation actually still owns and operates the house as a museum. It's been significantly restored and is considered the oldest stone house in the entire state of Georgia. Notably, you can see that stucco was actually taken off and the non-original front porch was also removed. And this shows it's another view of it. This next park is Eagle Tavern Historic Site in the city of Watkinsville in Oconee County. In a, this is sort of a similar story to uh, the Ansley House, uh, but one, so I'm kind of putting them together. In 1789, there was a Fort Edwards built in what's now Oconee County to defend the Muscogee attacks, um, the first building built by settlers west of the Oconee River. Some sources say the fort dates as far back as 1750. That doesn't really make a lot of sense given sort of the history of that region, but I still want to put that out though. Sometime around 1801, the fort was either remodeled or demolished entirely, and became a tavern called Eagle's Tavern. The University of Georgia had been tried in 1785, and in 1801, around the time that Eagle's Tavern opened, no classes had begun at UGA. In that year, the president of UGA, Ms. Josiah Meigs, had to choose where his new school would be. According to local folklore, he had two options. He could pick Watkinsville in Oconee County, or he could pick this new town called Athens, but no one had ever really heard of at the time. According to legend, he chose Athens because Watkinsville had a tavern, and that could be a bad influence, you know, by alcohol and all on students. Wouldn't want UGA being a party town or anything. Of course not. Um, sadly, the story is likely not true. The tavern may not have been opened yet, and the one that's now UGA was actually donated in 1800, a year before the story supposedly took place. Um, but it, make, it makes an interesting story, at least. It's funny. In 1820, the Eagles Tavern building was replaced. Uh, in 1836, it was bought by a man named Richard Richardson, who made many additions over the years to uh, the original building. It was used as a hotel up until 1930. According to the Oconee County Chamber of Commerce, where many famous guests stayed at the hotel, weirdly, all the ones listed the Civil War, there's uh, Robert Toombs, who was a senator for the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens, the Confederate Vice President, and Sidney Wanier, the Poet Wyatt of the Confederacy. By the 1930s, the building was falling apart, so when Neil Richardson Billups, a descendant of Richard Richardson, uh, purchased a building in 1934 in the hopes of preserving it. He was able to do some restoration work, but gave it to the state in 1956. 
I do want to mention real quick before we head on, this image of that tavern is from um, the Historic American Building Survey, part of the National Park Service. If you were ever looking for historic photos of Georgia buildings, it is a fantastic resource. I might highly recommend it, along with, of course, the State Archives and the Vanishing Georgia Collection. Of course, I'm putting a plug there being, being here. When the state was given this tavern in 1956, they were ecstatic as was thought the core of the building was the remains of Ford Edward. It hadn't been known, there had been a lot of remodeling and renovations done over the years, including that demolition in the 1820s. And it was thought that that 1780s Ford Edward had just been added on to over the years to become uh, the Van Parent Tavern. After the state got the property, they removed many of these later additions, but did not find the fort. Instead, they found that 1820s Tavern, which was in itself quite an amazing find. It was very well preserved. They did restore the tavern, but in 1975, they decided it had much more local in interest than statewide significance. Because of that, it was given to Oconee County later that year. At different times, it's been the Oconee County Chamber of Commerce and the Oconee Welcome Center. More recently, it's a museum that showcases the history of Watkinsville. It is also considered one of the most haunted spots in the state of Georgia, um, at least what the website says. This next park is John Tannen State Park, a former amusement park in Carrollton. Um, but when I first put together uh, this information, it was actually for a video series I did back during the pandemic. Um, this was the actually most watched video. It got like 400 views, like 10 times more than any of the others. Um, it really is an interesting story and it will become apparent in a moment as to why it's so well remembered. In 1954, a Carrollton entrepreneur named John W. Tanner decided that Carroll County needed a beach where the public could relax. There was just one problem. If you're familiar with Carrollton or the Carroll County area, you know it is near the Alabama state line, which is noticeably lacking in beaches. Um, he actually bought his own lake and hauled in boxcars full of sand from Florida to create a beach himself. In 1954, it opened and was called the Beach at Wakefield. Soon afterwards, the name was changed to Tanner's Beach. All of the advertisements uh, for Tanner's Beach, a lot of them in the AJC, have this fantastic sort of mid-century modern design. They're really inter interesting. So I wanted to include, this is probably the best one of them that I was able to find. The park advertised many amenities. They had picnic grounds, snack bars, and cottages. They had a tropical garden, which seems weird, off kind of middle of North Georgia. They had a storybook land with a miniature train. They had putt-putt and pedal boats. It was built in ads as the place you can meet the meet nice people and where you'll have the mostest fun. My personal favorite part of the park came in 1961 when a mystery caverns was added, which had its own witch doctor, whatever that means. Um, unfortunately, I found no pictures of the caverns or what the witch doctor might have been. Um, I know there was like a sort of like a robot type thing. No clue. I'd love to find out. About two years after that, in 1963, there was a small motel that was built for guests, and the late 1960s became home of a Georgia teen pageant. In 1971, the park was sold to the state under the condition to be named for John Tanner. The park's land at the time was 139 acres. After major renovations, the park reopened the next year as John Tanner State Park. During a lot of these renovations, we were moving more amusement park sort of aspects of the area, the storybook cabin, say storybook land and the mystery cabins were both removed. Um, John T Tanner Sr. himself did live long enough to see his brainchild become a state park, uh, passing away about a decade later in 1981. By the 2000, the park's visitation numbers were growing smaller and smaller. Uh, if you're looking for sort of amusement park type stuff, Six Flags become a much bigger and better option. Because of this, in 2010, it was transferred to Carroll County. The county actually brought in more sand and redid the beach um, and filled the lake with fish. So this now offers fishing opportunities there. It's called John Tenu Pike and offers boating, fishing, and hiking. In keeping with the park's original spirit, we also do have pedal boats and putt-putt. This next pike is George Washington Kyrie State Pike near the city of Ackworth in Bartow County. Um, it's kind of in a weird area. The address is usually say Aqua, but it's actually closer to either Emerson or Curtisville. So you can see I put all three on the slide. 
This is one of only six um, segregated state parks in the state of Georgia set aside for African Americans uh, before the 1960s. Uh, John Boyd Atkinson, shown here on the left, was born at July 26, 1904 in Crawfordsville, Georgia. He became very successful and in 1941 built his own house in Atlanta. Unfortunately, the Atlanta police said he could not move into his new home, as it was built on a white city block. At the time, there were certain street blocks designated white only and others were black only. After he couldn't move, he actually was encouraged to join the military and he became a Tuskegee Airman. During the war on June 11th, 1943, Georgia Supreme Court ruled that Atkinson could move into his new house, uh, ending the race block system in the city of Atlanta. After returning from World War II, Atkinson and many other African-American leaders uh, in Georgia were upset the Georgia State Parks were not open to them. At that time, they were entirely um, whites only. Inspired by this, in 1950, Atkinson petitioned the state to waste 345 acres next to a brand new Red Top Mountain State Park uh, near Cartersville. Atkinson's efforts were successful, and the new park was named George Washington Cairo State Park, after the famed scientist from Tuskegee. It is actually the only state park in Georgia history ever named after an African American. Atkinson became the park's first superintendent, and he built a clubhouse, docks, and a playground, and he also developed the park's beach. The park became incredibly popular and was host to many notable visitors, including Andrew Young and the King family. Uh, they were also able to become sort of an entertainment hotspot. Um, Ray Charles and Little Richard both performed here. In 1958, John Atkinson fell ill and had to resign as park superintendent. He went on to find a jewelry business and a plastic company both down in Atlanta. Today, if you go to the governor's mansion, the plaster work that you see was actually all done by his company. The second superintendent of the park was named James Clarence Bentham. The Bentham family grew up inside the park as they lived on the park grounds. Bentham's son, Robert, was the first African American to serve on Georgia Supreme Court. And for many oral history interviews with Robert Bentham talking about his time growing up inside George Washington Carver State Park. The park was very successful, attracting everyone from Boy Scouts to a professional water ski club. After state, the state parks were integrated in the late 1960s, however, fewer people began coming to the park, instead focusing on Red Top Mountain State Park right nearby. There are a lot of great photos when the park was open. Uh, this one shows uh, archery practice. There's a nice uh, playground right next to the water. On top is the docks uh, with some of the boats, and then down below is a family reunion. In 1975, the park was closed and turned over to the county, and became known as Bito Kyrie Park. At that time, it was open only for reservations. It continued under that system until 2016, it was renamed George Washington Kyrie Park, and was once again open to visitors. I would like to thank Trey Gaines for wider history center for the help in researching this park's history. Of all the former state parks in Georgia, this is probably the best documented, as Bito County has done a lot to try to preserve its story and its history. I mentioned this is one of just one of several segregated state parks for African Americans across our state that were created. I want to touch on the others before moving on. None of these are very well documented, so I had a difficult time researching some, but I didn't want to just include their stories. Fairchild State Park was named after a nearby community on the located with Jim Woodruff Reservoir, kind of where the Alabama, Georgia, Florida State uh, line is, where they all converge. Uh, construction began on the Jim Woodruff Dam, which created this reservoir in 1947, but completed in 1952. There was a whites only park nearby called Marvin Griffin State Park, founded in 1956, and this park for African Americans was opened in 1961. It seems like each of the, um, the African American parks was kind of paired with a, almost like a twin uh, in the same area, but offered similar amenities. The park's area was about 309 acres, it went to 255. There's very, very little information about it in newspapers that I've been able to find. Um, it's just a very mysterious place. Due to budget cuts in 1975, the park was closed. I've not found who runs the park today, but its boat launch is actually still open. Um, I don't know if it's the county or the city or what it is. Um, I mentioned this is sort of Alabama, Georgia, Florida's border though. There are actually a lot of state parks and former state parks in that area, so just kind of keep that region in mind. I'll be coming back to it at the end of the presentation. 
The Clikes Hill Dam on the South Carolina border was built between 1946 and 1954. In preparation for the new wake, on February 26, 1953, Keg Creek State Park was established for African Americans. Nearby was Mistletoe State Park for whites. Mistletoe State Park would actually not open until 1971. It took a long time to develop it. But Keg Creek State Park, at about 900 acres, was up, opened by 1955. It underwent a variety of improvements over the next 20 years, many of the well documented in the Augusta paper. Um, this one actually was a lot of good info from when it was open. In 1975, due to those same budget cuts, the pipe was closed. A total of 75 acres of the former Keg Creek State Pike were given, were transferred to the county and became Wildwood Pike, while the remaining acreage became Keg Creek Wildlife Management Area. Today, Wildwood Pike is a popular campground, considered one of the best in the Augusta area, while Keg Creek Wildlife Management Area offers hiking and boating on Clarks Hill Lake. Well, it may seem with Lincoln State Pike in the city of Millen that it's named for Abraham, which is, of course, the obvious choice. Um, period accounts actually imply it's named for Benjamin Lincoln, who was one of Washington's generals. I don't think Benjamin Lincoln was ever in that area, so I haven't found why the pike we named for him, but that's at least what the newspapers seem to imply. In 1955, D.L. Few of Millen gave 53 acres of land to the state to be used as a state park. It was opened by 1958. After integration in the late 1960s, the 53 acres of land were given to the city of Millen. It was founded with Magnolia Spring State Park nearby. Again, it just kind of been redundant. Um, in 1997, 49.68 acres of this former state park were sold by the city. The land is now a contracting business. It's kind of a storage, like staging area, kind of where they keep their miscellaneous stuff. If you look at it on Google Maps, you can see like the Pike swimming pool and many of the Pike amenities are actually still standing, just overgrown and um, surrounded by construction trucks. It seems, from, at least from the Google Map aerials, it seems kind of creepy, honestly. Yam Grandy State Park got its name from Yam Grandy Creek, a tributary of the Ohupi River. Well, I have not found the origin of the creek's name. The first reference to it in newspapers is all the way back in 1799. It's obviously a very old name. Construction began in 1954, and the park opened July of 1957. The park had picnic tables, a pool, a hiking, and a playground, all in just 11 acres next door to the Swainsboro City Cemetery. Between 1964 and 1969, the park was integrated. Um, after the park was integrated, it conditioned really began to decline. In 1971, the Atlanta General Constitution had a nice article on the entire state park system that said, the parks are consistently good, consistently quaint, and well-maintained, attractive, and worthwhile, with a single exception, Yam Grandy State Park. It already had quite a bad reputation. <laughs> In 1977, the now five-acre park was given to the city of Swainsboro. Uh, it really kind of kept its sort of status is not a great place to be. It's since actually been cleaned up and is now Gumlog Pike. It's supposed to be actually pretty nice. The only park for African Americans uh, still around today is a portion of Venice Memorial State Park, uh, sort of in Cordell, Georgia. The park opened in 1946. There was a portion of it set aside for African Americans. When the parks were integrated in the late 1960s, it just became a part of the rest of the park. This next state park is one we likely all have heard of, um, Jekyll Island State Park, um, of course, on Jekyll Island near Brunswick. Jekyll Island itself has a long history dating back to the Spanish. In 1510, the Spanish claimed the island and named it the Isla de Belenas, meaning the Whale Island. I'm assuming I'm pronouncing that right. I'm not that far in my college Spanish, um, so we'll cross my fingers. In 1562, the French claimed the island and called it the Ile de la Somme. Again, I've not taken any college French, so I'll hope that pronunciation's right. The Spanish and French fought the island's control until the French were finally defeated. Um, after that, the English began to claim the land, and then the Spanish would fight for the next, um, from about 1663 up until August 4th in the 1730s. This time it was the Spanish who lost. In 1732, James Oglethorpe founded the colony of Georgia and named this island Jekyll Island after Joseph Jekyll. Jekyll had given a lot of money to help start the colony. Um, he lived back in England. 
Jack Lyman has a lot of weird sort of parts of George's story. Um, there's a William Horton who lived there and uh, shortly after the colony of Georgia's founding, who also established Georgia's first brewery on the island. And in 1858, it became the site of a second to last uh, sh ship with enslaved cargo, enslaved people um, as cargo uh, to land the United States. At one time, it was thought to be the final. That actually was a ship called the Quatilda in um, Alabama, but landed about two years away too. From 1888 to 1946, Byron was operated by the Jekyll Island Club. The club's members built many homes and cottages along the island, and many prominent Gilded Age families were members, including the Vanderbilts, the Morgans, the Goulds, and the Rockefellers, and Joseph Pulitzer. In 1910, five members of the Jekyll Island Club um, and two government officials met here to formulate a plan for a central banking system. The plan they created ended up becoming the Federal Reserve Bank, founded by the Federal Reserve Bank or the Federal Reserve Act 1913. If you go to the um, Federal Reserve Bank branch in Atlanta, they will tell you all about this meeting. They are very proud to study it here in Georgia. During World War II, the Jekyll Island Club was forced to close, and the land was purchased by the state. It opened in 1947 as Jekyll Island State Park. The last time I spoke of the U.S. Caribs was on the Dewey Governors controversy, when Dewey different men claimed they were governor of Georgia back in 1948 or 1946. One of those men was Melvin Thompson, who ended up becoming the actual governor of Georgia. He was um, governor from 1947 when the controversy was resolved until 1948 when a special election was held when Eugene Talmadge was elected. So he was only in office about a year and a half. The creation of Jekyll Island State Park was sort of considered the highlight of his um, time in office, really his big accomplishment. The park became quite popular, but it was very expensive to maintain. Um, obviously, all these Gilded Age mansions and Gilded Age resorts cost a lot of money to keep up. Because of this, in 1950, the Jekyll Island Authority was created to manage the island. Jekyll Island is still managed and run by the state, uh, the club's houses and museums, and the clubhouse itself is a resort hotel. However, it has no connection to the state park system anymore. This, uh, you can see this brochure actually calls it, uh, this um, postcard actually calls it Jekyll Island State Park. So it was only about two years it could have been published. If you look at the brochures up here at the end of today's presentation, you can see a couple of them mention um, Jekyll Island State Park, which is a great way to help date some of these because it was such a big attraction, it was mentioned a lot. Next, the McKay House State Historic Site, a Revolutionary War home in Augusta. It has a very um, surprising end to its story. Around 1750, the McKay Trading Post also called the Old White House, or the McKay House, was built in Augusta. In 1779, Englishman Thomas Brown was placed in charge of the Augusta area, which local patriots didn't like so after all the middle of the American Revolution. They had Brown tied and feathered and sent him away from the city. Brown was humiliated and decided to retaliate. He gathered up some loyalist troops, marched back towards Augusta, and in September of 1780, um, met Elijah Clark in battle right next door to the McKay house. On September 18th, after four days of fighting, Elijah Clark was forced to retreat. Thomas Brown was not satisfied and ended up uh, executing all the prisoners that he had captured, who were 13. Uh, they were actually hung from the McKay house staircase. And because of that, the McKay house became a very big part of Augusta's Revolutionary War history. In 1946, the Richmond County Historical Society purchased this old White House and opened it as a museum. In 1964, it was purchased by the state and restored to its Revolutionary War appearance. The Atlanta Constitution called it uh, Augusta's Revolutionary War Shrine, and Governor Ernest Vanderbilt spoke of the grand opening. If you go on the virtual, virtual vault of a state archives today, there's actually a postcard of a diorama of, um, it's of the person who's getting hung from the staircase. And the postcard shows the very dark diorama and a lot of like young school children walking on quite mystified. It's um very dark. Unfortunately, with the state park, they found just one major problem with or a couple of major problems. As a couple things about the house just didn't make any sense. It was 600 feet away from where account said it should have been, and it was made of an entirely different material. The oldest account said it was made out of like a stone. So this is obviously a wooden house. In 1975, they finally came solve the mystery as to what had happened. This home is not the McKay house. The McKay house was next door. This is the um, 
at what Ezekiel Harris House. After it was correctly identified, it was given to the city of Augusta. Way back in the 1790s, Ezekiel Harris um, had moved to Augusta as a tobacco merchant. Harris decided he created a, to create a nice town for the tobacco trade and called it Harrisburg, placing the Ezekiel Harris House at the center of it. He built it in 1797, well after the American Revolution. Later, this house was later mistakenly identified as the McKay House, creating about a century of misunderstanding. <laughs> Harrisburg's community never became a major city, and Harrisburg is now just a neighborhood of Augusta. Today, the house is run by the city of Augusta and is correctly advertised as the Ezekiel Harris House. The Smithsonian has called it the best preserved or the finest 18th century house surviving in Georgia. What really happened to the real McKay House is a mystery waiting to be solved. After the Revolutionary War, it seems to have just disappeared and no one knows what happened to it. This next state park is Blackbone State Park up near Dahlonega, uh, technically near the city of Aurelia. This was one of the hardest state parks to research, but I had to include it for reasons that will become apparent in just a moment. Aurelia was at one time the height of Georgia's gold rush. In fact, Aurelia comes from Latin word for gold. The town was founded in 1832, and within a year had grown to 1,000 residents and became the unofficial Lumpkin County seat. In 1832, there was a dispute over who owned the city of Aurelia, so the county seat was actually moved to a nearby town called Dahlonega. Dahlonega became very famous and a major tourist attraction, and Aurelia was completely forgotten and practically abandoned. It's considered a ghost town of Georgia today, as there's only one building remaining from the original um, sort of community of Aurelia in the 1800s. It's a very interesting place to visit. In 1966, Wayne Blackburn and his wife celebrated their 50th anniversary by giving 193 acres of land to the state of Georgia. I haven't really found why they owned land um, up near Aurelia. They were actually living in Tampa at the time. This land that they owned had been a gold mine, and it became a new state park named after them, Blackbone State Park. The land came fully equipped with some type of old gold mining apparatus uh, and a fully furnished house. Even if it would not be used for gold mining, visitors could still pan for gold like they would have back in the 1830s. Camping sites were soon added to welcome gold-seeking visitors. By 1970, the park had 231 acres, and it had a nice big nature trail called the Pioneer Trail. What, there's one article that AJC pointed out, this made Georgia the only state in the United States to own its own gold mine, to own its own railroad, the Western Atlantic, and for the state to own a hotel, the Henry Grady in downtown Atlanta. In August 1970, construction began on the new five-acre Blackburn State Pike Lake, along with a bathhouse. An article from AJC in April 1971, mentions there was a geological museum about the gold history of the area, along with a mine that visitors could view. The cost of paying for gold is $1 for adults and 50 cents for kids. Um, some of the articles make it very clear. People were not expecting to find $1 worth of gold. It's a very unprofitable venture, but um, it was fun to pay in at least. <laughs> I've always hoped I see about those people who go out to Arkansas to that one diamond mine state pipe that has the diamonds. I always hope I'll do something like that and like find the big one, but uh, no luck with the gold like this. In 1974, the state almost purchased 205 acres to add to the pike, which would have extended it out to the Etowah River. The plan was actually shot down by then Lieutenant Governor Westy Maddox, an action which he faced heavy criticism. One of the main public figures to criticize him for it was Governor Jimmy Kaidu. Uh, Governor Kaidu and Lieutenant Governor Maddox famously did not get along well. Um, and this was just a part of that contentious relationship. In 1974, a very, very famous visitor came to Blackbone State Park. Um, he was eight feet tall and very hairy and named Bigfoot. Now, before y'all think I'm crazy, I do not believe in Bigfoot. I just think he's very funny. So I wanted to include a reference to this. Um, in September 2nd, 1974, Wes Alexander, Chris Stevens, and Bob Mighton all spotted this giant eight foot hairy thing walking through the woods. Um, who they thought was Bigfoot. Who knows if they actually saw, but it's kind of a fun story. I mentioned I put this presentation together originally as a video series, and I hadn't found this story. I was um, actually editing the video trying to find just one more picture when I ran across a random reference in a, I don't even remember where it was, to um, 
the, this Bigfoot sighting. And to go back, leave a coin for video, and um, do it again. Because I just had to include this. In 1975, due to state budget cuts, the pipe was closed. It was hoped to be reopened sometime in the future, as then plans were being finalized, um, used as an outdoor lab for area schools. It was kind of felt it was a bit redundant due to the nearby Dahlonega Gold Museum um, up in Dahlonega. Um, it's not fully connected to this, but if you haven't been there, I highly suggest it. So excellent site to visit. Sometime after 1976, this land that's located near today's Blackburn Elementary School was sold to Lumpkin County. Today, the elementary school is there. It's partly a housing development, and there seems to be a pike there um, as well. It's all kind of been subdivided over the years. Several years ago, my family was visiting Dahlonega and ended up coming back home through the town of Aurelia. And I thought, oh, we got to look for the state park. I remember exactly where it was. We went looking for it, and I couldn't find a trace. Only come to realize when I was putting this presentation here about two months ago, we were on the wrong road. <laughs> it was actually the road just to the north. <laughs> So close. This next park's Governor Troop Natural Resource Reservation in the city of Southerton in Chartwin County. Governor Troop, uh, or George Troop, was born in September 8, 1780, at the McIntosh Bluffs in present day Alabama, renamed for his grandfather, um, George McIntosh. He graduated from Princeton in 1797, became a lawyer in Savannah. He eventually entered the state legislature, worked to the U.S. House, and then finally the U.S. Senate. He tried running for governor twice unsuccessfully, um, but then finally on his third attempt in 1822, he was elected. As governor, he negotiated the Treaty of Indian Springs with his cousin, William McIntosh, but, um, I mentioned the treaty earlier at the start of the presentation. Troop is, because of this, considered responsible for actually um, removing Muskogee from Georgia. Because of this, he's not really considered um, a state's greatest governor. In 1827, he stepped down due to time limits. He was elected to the U.S. Senate in 1829, and went to the to 1830, during his final public office. He owned several plantations across the state, including one in Lones County called the Val d'Asta, named after an alpine valley in Italy that the climate was similar to. The way that was once the Val d'Asta plantation is Val d'Asta today, uh, named after uh, the plantation he owned. Another plantation of his was named Rosemont in Trotwin County. Uh, in 1856, while visiting this plantation, Troop passed away here. He was buried next to his brother, Robert Wackland Troop, on the plantation. Unfortunately, there's very little info about when Rosemont was as part of a state park system. By 1941, there were 888 acres of land given to the state called Governor Troop Natural Resource Reservation. Um, at least by 1942, it was still considered under development. You can see kind of on the map here, it's a bit hard to read where it says Governor Troop Natural Resources Preservation. Um, I haven't found much info about if the pike was ever actually officially opened, if it was ever really anything just to, to see, or if it was more just preserving the land. Um, a lot of its history is just very mysterious. The pike itself would last until the 1960s when the tomb was given to the Georgia Historical Commission. And this plague, simply called Troop's Tomb, lasted until 1973, the commission itself disbanded. Uh, today it is still preserved, um, it's along one of the major highways. You can see this is the tomb itself today. Boy, of Rosemont Plantation at uh, Tone Pike has been returned to use as a private hunting ground and cattle farm called Rosemont. Uh, it's been owned by the Rood family, R-O-O-D, since 2006. This next one is a museum to Georgia, to the Georgia Peach himself, Ty Cobb. Uh, the museum was off in Royston in Franklin County. Tyrus Raymond Cobb was born December 18, 1886 in Banks County, but grew up in Royston, where he wanted to play baseball. As a professional player, he first played for the Aniston Steelers in Alabama, and then for the Detroit Tigers. In Detroit, he became famous and earned his ironic nickname of the Georgia Peach. He was well known for his temper, um, supposedly he killed someone, though modern biographers actually cast doubt on that claim. Um, he's going to be involved in many fights, however, that is verified. After 21 years of playing baseball, he retired in 1926. He set many records while playing, and to this day, his career batting average at .366 is the highest of all time. 
Harbert, when he retired, moved to Augusta and used the money he had made while playing baseball to invest in Coca-Cola, and he became quite wealthy because of it. He didn't quite live up to his, to his um, mean-spirited temper that he was known to have, as a lot of the money that he um, was able to make on Coca-Cola, he actually reinvested in the community where he grew up. He was a big philanthropist and did a lot for local children. In 1936, he was actually the Baseball Hall of Fame. He passed away on January 7, July 17th, 1961. Just two days after his death, Royston Chamber of Commerce announced that they were working on plans for a Ty Cobb Museum. In that year, a cornerstone was laid, but by 1972, it had not yet been completed. Once the building was finally built, they not had enough artifacts. Most of the baseball artifacts from Cobb's life were at the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, and they had not been able to reach the family to see what they might have kept. Because of that, it was kind of a museum without anything to show. Between 1972 and 1974, it became a part of the state park system. During this time, the museum finally opened it, but still without a lot of artifacts. Because of this, in 1975, it was sold to the city of Royston for exactly $1. Just two weeks after the sale, the museum actually closed and became a voice in City Hall. There is, much more recently, a Ty Cobb Museum in Voiston in a former hospital building. Um, it, however, is unrelated to this OU Museum. That OU Museum is actually now a library. This museum, if you go to it, it's very nice. I will admit I am not a baseball fan, but I actually like this museum. It's very cool. I want to say one of my favorite, absolute favorite stories uh, for last, Santa Domingo State Park. There is no former state park which brings me more joy than this story. So I just had to say for the big finale. The Native Americans who lived in the area uh, along the Georgia coast were the Wawi, G-U-A-L-E, and the Timuca. In 1568, Spanish Jesuits have decided to establish missions along the coast to try to um, convert them to Christianity. After two years, they were very unsuccessful. Several of them were killed and they ended up leaving the area. In 1587, Franciscan friars tried again, and this time had a bit more luck. Spanish missions would cross through in Georgia for about 80 years. Not all the missions were along the coast. Uh, there was actually one of the Okefenokee Swamp, and I've recently found reference to one uh, in a much more recent account. It was um, E. Moton Coulter's Destroyed History of Georgia. So there was a Sabacola mission at the confluence of the uh, Chattahoochee and the Point Rivers, uh, which would put it sort of um, along the Alabama state line. By the 1660s, the Spanish were facing um, sort of pushback from local peoples. Um, after that point, the missions really began to go into decline. One of them, the Santo Domingo de Tolage, was attacked in 1661 by Native Americans. After that, the English would attack several times as they also claimed this land, and it would be English pirates who would attack the ones along the coast. Finally, by uh, the time Oglethorpe had arrived, the Spanish were entirely gone and the missions were abandoned. The final, um, after American Revolution, there was a Dr. Robert Grant who purchased land in the mouth of the Otamaha River where the Santa Domingo del Tawage mission had once sat. He established a plantation called a Weiser Field and built a house out of Tabby. In the 1820s, built a sugar works out of the same material. Tabby, if you're not familiar with it, is sort of a concrete type material. It originates in North Africa, was later brought over to the United States. You make a fine powder out of oyster shells, mix it with water, sand, and other broken shells, and we can form it into walls. It's a very strong and durable material. Um, the Spanish would use it to build their Spanish missions, while Oglethorpe also used it in many of his early ventures building up the early colony of Georgia. In 1833, a Brunswick Otamaha Canal was built through um, the Weiserfield Plantation. This cut off the sugar mill's water supply, and because of it, it was closed. After that, the plantation kind of went into decline. In 1899, Katie Wolford, an Atlanta businessman, purchased, um, some, of the acre, purchased some of the acreage um, and tried to preserve it. In 1934, he gave 350 acres of his land to the state for use as a state park. Archaeologists were amazed at the tabby ruins that they found uh, inside the Weisfield Plantation. These ruins of the same area as the lost Santo Domingo del Tawage mission. So they were ecstatic when they realized it must be the same. It has to be, right? The park opened the next year at Santo Domingo State Park. 
dedicated to that former Spanish mission. The Venezuelan cultivation coal uh, helped with Pike's early development by building um, building trails, building a road, clearing out underbrush, um, and they also built the Pike's early museum, which looked like a Spanish mission. If you're interested, after today's presentation, I have um, some brochures up here in the front, front of the room. One of them is actually a San Flamingo State Park brochure. I think it's pretty rare for very few copies out there, but it has a lot of great pictures of the work that the CCC did and many of the buildings which they built. The park became very well known nationally um, because of its archaeological significance. In 1939, it was featured in this promotional video of the New Deal, um, where it kind of gained a bit more national attention. I have had a video down just to the park talking about the mission. Um, I want to play it real quick. Sounds like a lovely place to visit, right? I want to go there. Um, there's just one piece of bad news, of course. These aren't Spanish missions. <laughs> um, shortly before the start of World War II, the National Park Service made this startling discovery. There had been a bit of questions for it to a while. They hadn't found any Spanish artifacts, um, but they still thought, you know, it's tabby ruins. It has to be Spanish, right? Um, the National Park Service realized we were found about a wise field plantation. What they're working out was not some type of lost Spanish mission off from the coast, but was a sugar mill um, that had been built in the 1820s. Very dismayed, the state ended up closing the pike in 1945. The next year it became Boys State Orphanage. It was based on a similar orphanage off of the Midwest called Boys Town, which is later a movie with Mickey Rooney and Spencer Tracy. In 1996, Boys State Orphanage was privatized and became known as Morning Star, which is how it's still open today. This picture shows the front gate of of the orphanage. Before that, it was actually the entrance to the state park. Um, the, back of this, the back of this one brochure actually has a picture of what this looked like when it was the state park. It's hard to see, but up at the top in the ironwork, it says Santo Domingo State Park. When it became the orphanage, they just put on a new metal sign on top of it. I haven't been able to verify yet if this um, uh, gateway is still there or not, and if it has the Santo Domingo name um, still intact. Now, as interesting as this story is, what's even weird about it is that it happened twice. <laughs> um, New Bob Brunswick, oh, we're getting better ahead of myself, my bad. New Brunswick was another site called Santa Maria State Park, which looked like this, this is according to one artist rendering. Um, it was near the city of, sorry, my bad, city of St. Mary's in Camden County, about the Florida border. Um, the St. Mary's mission was established around 1575 with Santa Maria de Guadalupe, or Santa Maria de, Yas, de los Yamasos, or Santa Maria Motel. There's a couple different names for it out there. Some of the stuff I've seen in Pike, it may not have actually even been a real place. Um, it's very mysterious. Ruins became what was thought to be the Santa Maria mission, became very popular and a major tourist attraction of St. Mary's. In 1929, Calvin Coolidge himself visited. It can be seen here on the slide. Uh, he's here in the bowler hat. Ruins were two stories tall, 120 feet long, and 75 feet wide. It became a state park in the 1940s, called Santa Maria State Park, or the Santa Maria Natural Resource Reservation. It was around 600 acres which were preserved. In the 1970s, however, it shrunk just to about 60. Um, it was in the 1940s that we realized that um, it was not actually a Spanish mission. And after that, while well, St. Domingo Mission was actually, um, of course, became an orphanage, this pike actually hung on um, for a while, even under that original Santa Maria name. It wouldn't disappear until around 1980, uh, lasted a very long time. Today, it's actually a Camden County Park. In the 1940s, it was realized its true history came from John Houston McIntosh, um, born in 1773 here in Georgia. During the American Revolution, he actually tried to invade Florida. He briefly was the director of the Republic of East Florida before that all um, kind of fell apart. He came back to Georgia in 1815. He started a plantation near St. Mary's called the New Canaan Plantation. 
and it was ruins of a sh sugar mill from 1829 that was thought to be the Spanish mission. The sugar mill itself burned in the 1840s and was never rebuilt. It was ruins of this mill that were thought to be the Santa Maria mission. Since the 1930s, these ruins have kind of fallen apart significantly. You may notice my picture from Calvin Coolidge, who were very tall. A lot of that second story is now gone now, it's devoted away. Today, they're just about one story uh, in McIntosh Sugar Mill Park, which is right near Crooked Mill River State Park. Ruins are very popular as a tourist site today and as a wedding venue, uh, weirdly. So they make a nice uh, backdrop. Today, there's some questions whether or not the Santa Maria Mission was even real. The others at Santa Maria Mission and the others are shown on that map definitely confirm that they existed. This one's a bit more up in the air. Before moving on to that, I did also want to point out this actually was several other instance, instances of this happening. We thought it was a Spanish mission, turned out not to be. Um, there were always three other times. Uh, none of them became state parks, however, so I didn't include them on the slideshow. One of them was thought to be a Spanish mission they, uh, called the Tolomato site near the city of Darien. Um, it was only in the 1940s we realized its true history. It was a rum distillery. It was very different than a mission. <laughs> So I covered just about 15 parks in today's presentation. However, as I mentioned at the start, there are over um, 40, about 45 sites. This list is all the ones I wasn't able to get to today. I want to go through some of them real quick and just kind of share um, a bit of brief story behind them. On the top left is Nancy Hart State Park. This was the site of the Nancy Hart Cabin. Nancy Hart was a Revolutionary War heroine um, who supposedly killed some British spies. It was a state park I'm told about with the 1970s. Hyde State Park right below is named after Hyde County, which is named after Nancy Hyde. Um, Hyde State Park is actually the most recent former state park to become a former state park, as it was opened up until the pandemic uh, when it was closed and became a county park. I own the Spring State Park was a um, health resort back in the 1920s. Its name comes from some type of Native American legend of a Indian princess and a Romeo and Juliet story named Myona. Um, I haven't found any great actual, you know, Native American accounts of this Mayona story. It seems like the help is what people actually just made it up um, to try to get people to go to resort. But regardless, it's kind of interesting. It's in Montezuma, Georgia. The park itself wasn't really near made any major roads and they had a lot of trouble getting people to it. The Crawford Wong Museum is actually still open as a museum. Uh, he was the father of modern anesthetic. Um, Spiro Breath State Park was along the Flint River, it was founded by Governor Jimmy Carter. Uh, Midway Colony Museum told the story of Wyman Hall and Button Gwinnett, two devotees of independent signings in Wyoming State. Bobby Brown State Park was on the Savannah River. It um, was actually on the site of a lost town of Georgia called Petersburg. Petersburg was back in the 1790s, our state's third largest town behind Savannah and Augusta. Over time, it ended up off of major trading paths. It kind of went away, and today its site is underneath a lake. Bobby Brown State Park was built sort of at the top of a hill um, from where Petersburg once had been. Fort Jackson, fairly down, uh, is similar to Fort Pulaski. It's a, uh, I think it was a War of 1812 site. So it's actually a bit older. Um, I mentioned earlier, that, keep in mind the Florida, Georgia, the Florida, um, Georgia and Alabama state line. Uh, Bainbridge State Park at the very bottom in Decatur County is one of those parks that was right near that area, along with um, Fairchild from OU. Uh, let's see, moving on, Chattahoochee Palisade State Park uh, in Fulton County is the only state park to kind of get almost a promotion as to become a national park. It's not part of the Chattahoochee River National Recreation Area. Um, Lake Rainier Island State Park is the only state park ever in Georgia's history on Lake Rainier. It was there from when the lake opened until the 70s. It is today a Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville. Um, it has very much changed significantly. When I began researching all these former state parks, I never expected I'd be saying Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville in any context, yet here we are. Um, Confederate Naval Museum is now the Civil War Naval Museum off in Columbus. Um, Grasstown Bald, the highest point in the state of Georgia back in the 1940s was a state park. And it's actually mentioned in one of these brochures that I have out here on the table. The final fun one of this slide is Okefenokee Swamp State Park. There were a lot of commercial ventures trying to get people out to Okefenokee Swamp. Um, some of them seem kind of amusement park-like. This was an attempt to make a state park one in theory it would be a bit more dignified. There's a lot of great footage of it from a 
promotional video for the Edsel automobile. Uh, Ed, the Edsel company came through and filmed a lot of video of a man and his wife um, driving around visiting Okefenokee Swamp, all while enjoying their brand new Edsel car. Um, but the, car, the car itself was not successful, of course, and neither was the state park. This final slide is the mystery state parks. These, I could find info where they existed, but so little info about them. Really, I could only find a location for some of them. My notice is at the top, Four Mile Creek State Park, Seminole County near Bainbridge, East Bank State Park, Seminole County near Bainbridge, and Brinsville State Park, Seminole County near Bainbridge. Also in that Florida, Alabama, Georgia border. There's also a Marvin Griffin State Park that is there today. I think it may have to actually change its name. Um, and there's at least one other in that area. The reason why is pretty simple. There were so many state parks in this one area. In the 1950s, we had a governor of Georgia from that region, Marvin Griffin. And he evidently was able to get a lot of, um, a lot of money funneled into um, his hometown uh, for state parks. The only park I might have sort of a clue as to what it may be today is the Winoya Wayside State Park in Way County. This is possibly the modern day YS Walker State Park, but I've not been able to actually make a connection between the two. Uh, and Zane State Park at the very bottom is now a wildlife management area. There's in, not much info about when it was actually a, um, info about when it was a state park or who the Zans are. I think they gave the land, I haven't confirmed that. Now that I've reached the end, I would of course like to sort of send out a bat signal of, um, if you have any info about any of these parks, the ones I've talked about in detail, or on those final two slides. I would absolutely love to hear it. Um, there's not a lot of info available about some of these pokes, and if you know anything that can add to these stories, absolutely let me know. Um, are there any questions? Yes. I haven't found anything like that. I don't think there is, but it really is just um, kind of almost surplusing the land and trying to kind of, frankly, make it someone else's problem. <laughs> um, <laughs> a, a lot of it was just, as I mentioned with some of this, a lot of it was just kind of budget cuts and trying to find another way to kind of support uh, these pokes. Yes. So Grasstown Ball, is that now a national park? It is, I believe, part of a national forest. It, the state, I think, has some type of role in its preservation. I don't think it's um, as much as it used to, though. Um, it was a state park from around 1946 up until, I think, like the mid-50s. It wasn't very long. Sort of. So Stone Mountain is owned by the state of Georgia, and I believe it's technically kind of part of a state park system. It's kind of like, it's not quite like all the others because it is privately managed. Uh, it used to be the people who managed Silver Dollar City manage it. I don't, I think it's changed since then. It's kind of owned by the pub, owned, publicly owned, owned by the state for the state parks, but privately managed. Um, that's why they can charge such a big entrance fee and why the like, state parks passes don't work there. Um, it's a complicated relationship. I don't fully understand it myself. Any other questions? Comments, questions, complaints, ideas, solutions, ideas, anything. <laughs> Kennesaw State University. I have been there one semester. Uh, well, I guess half a semester so far. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. Had a great time. That's the goal, yes. <laughs> However, did you guess? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Do I have a question in the back? They had a rough idea of who the missions were based on the new for instance, the Santa Domingo mission was known to be at the end of the Altamaha River. So they kind of had a rough idea, and they knew that the missions were made of tabby. So we found tabby ruins in the same area they thought it would be. They really got their hopes up. I will say the story of the missions isn't all kind of um, 
uh, folks like that. There is one site, the Santa Catalina de Wally Mission on, I think it's St. Simon's Island, that in the 1980s, the National Flag Service found and verified it is, in fact, a Spanish mission site. It's the only, as far as I know, the only one in the state of Georgia, but they've actually confirmed its location. There's no um, ruins above ground out there today. Everything's below. It seems to have been leveled um, sometime after the Spanish left. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>